Greetings, everyone. Welcome to FTE's webinar, Economic Freedom and Pandemics in American History. It is now 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Time on Wednesday, May 13th, 2020, and we will be begin recording the webinar. As part of the Foundation for Teaching Economics efforts to promote excellence in economics education, I'm pleased to present this online seminar examining economic freedom and pandemics in American history. I'm Ted Tucker, Executive Director of the Foundation, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, economic historian, Professor Price Fishback. Professor Fishback is the Thomas R. Brown Professor of Economics at the University of Arizona. He's a research associate for the National Bureau of Economic Research and a fellow of the Tia Kreff Institute. Dr. Fishback also served as the past president for the Economic History Association and earned his PhD in economics from the University of Washington. His research interests include the political economy of Roosevelt's New Deal, state labor legislation during the progressive era, the American economy during World War II, and he recently wrote an insightful review of the book, The Pox of Liberty, How the Constitution Left Americans Rich, Free, and Prone to Infection. Professor Fishback has been a longtime instructor in our Economic Forces in American History program, and we're grateful for him giving today's presentation. Following his talk, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and we will post a recording of the webinar and his slides on the FTE website. Please use the Q&A feature to submit questions following the presentation. After the webinar, we ask that you complete a short evaluation on today's presentation. So, Professor, Fishback, if you'd like to take over the screen. Great. So it's great to see you all, or not see you right now, but it's great to be here and great to be able to talk to you. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about epidemics in American history. I'm going to start out with a little bit of discussion about just death rates and things like that. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start walking through various epidemics. I'm going to start with the Spanish flu of, of 1918. Uh, and then I'm going to start talking a lot about Werner Truscan's book, The Pox of Liberty, where he talks about the trade-offs between liberty and, uh, and economic growth and epidemics and the problems that you have in trying to control epidemics. So in that one, we're going to walk through what happened with yellow fever. We're going to walk through what happened with uh, smallpox and then typhoid. And then at the end, I, if I've got some time, I'll talk about the, the current situation how the, and the government response currently and what's going on. So anyway, so that should get us started. And um, we will have the slides ready and we should have a great time. Basically, high standards of living and health move together. And so here we are in 1800, you can see all these various countries, almost everybody's down here. The US is this little circle here. I think the US is here, somehow this has gotten missing. The US is over here. Basically what happens is you're rich, you live a lot longer. And so they tend to move together. Being, rich, being healthier makes you more productive and at the same time, being richer allows you more, a higher standard of living, better diets, better housing, better food, better uh, space in all sorts of different ways, uh, and all sorts of drugs and stuff that make you better off. Okay, so epidemics at the start. So if you look at Europeans' initial contact with the Americas, I'm sure that they wish that they could have stopped everybody from showing up because the Spanish brought smallpox and influenza. This led to major epidemics that killed most of the native populations. One of the biggest ones was smallpox, as you can see in this picture up over in here. Then when you get the original Jamestown colony, the first permanent colony in the, in the United States, they arrive in May of 1607. Okay, so basically it's a good thing to remember that cities were death traps all the way up until the early 1900s. They had lousy sanitation and sewage until around 1900. Much denser populations meant that they spread economics more easily. I mean, one of, the one of the facts about this, if you had a kid up under age five in London at the time in the early 1800s, 50% of those kids died. Okay, and then males versus female, the life expectancy of birth was about 38 years old for, for, uh, for everybody overall. The life expectancy after childhood, so in other words, once you've made it through childhood, you're going to live a lot longer, was 60 for men, but it was only 40 for women. The reason for that was that many died while giving birth. Uh, and then another big group died in their 60s. So that led to everybody to this bimodal distribution where everybody ends up, or the women end up having an average age of 40. 
let me do this. I'm going to I'm going to actually leave it this way if everybody can see it this way because actually that way I can actually highlight things more easily. I don't I don't that, everything else is screwed up. So this gives you an idea what the overall death rate was. And so this is the deaths per thousand in the United States. And what they did was we went from about 21 deaths per thousand in, in a typical year in 1870 or 1880 to nine in in 1960. So basically that was arguably the greatest reduction in mortality in human history. And so over here, you have the life expectancy at birth. The typical life expectancy at birth in 1880 was only about 40 years. It ends up being 70 years by 1960. It's just incredible. This is for the Caucasian population. The African-American population rises a, lot, a great deal as well, but not, not as fast as it does for the Americans. And then infant mortality rates. This is one of the most incredible things. You can see it's like 215 in 1880, and it drops down to 23 per thousand. So one-fifth of all, all infants were dying in 1880, and so now it's down to only about uh, one one hundred. So that's just amazing. If you go down to the bottom here, you can see in, in 2017, we've improved even more over the last couple of years. One of the biggest surprises, though, has been between 2010 and 2017 was a slight drop in the life expectancy at birth for, for the Caucasian population due to the opi opioid epidemic. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can die during the 19th and early 20th century. There was yellow fever, which is described here. You get jaundice, which gives you the yellow eyes. It's caused by a mosquito. You've got smallpox, which is sitting here. This is someone who who's has smallpox, and a lot of people get this kind of thing. This was a huge killer. Werner Treskin thinks that this is the killer that killed more people than anybody in human history. Then you have problems with typhoid. So these are the three major things we're going to talk about when we talk about Werner's book. Now, so why did the death rates fall from 1800 to 1930? Well, one of the key reasons was you had improved diets and standard livings for the whole period. And that was probably the predominant reason between 1890 and 1910. After that, it became better public health, sewer and water treatments. And these basically eliminated like waterborne diarrheal diseases like typhoid. Okay. Now, you also don't want to underestimate the small, thing, underestimate the small things. Their hand washing was huge. We're talking about hand washing still today as being very important for COVID-19. Boiling water and milk for babies. The Shepherd Towner Act in the 1920s actually gave each state about a million dollars to go hire public health nurses to go out and talk to people. And Melissa Thomason and Carolyn Mayling did this study where they showed that for a dollar, for like a dollar of spending, got a huge improvement in mortality. And mostly what they were doing was, is teaching them to do simple things like this. So, and then you have quarantine and tracing during epidemics. Now, the problem is better medicine. A lot of people talk about that. You know, we have Louis Pasteur and the germ theory disease in the 1870s, but it just doesn't do much beforehand. The doctor basically patted your head and said nice things to you. They could heal your bones and things like that, but could do very little for diseases. And so, now, why do the death rates fall after 1930? Well, same kind of issues here again. You get improved diets and standard of living for the whole period. So you get drastic improvements just on that. So even without eliminating epidemics, you're getting big improvements. The public health and improvements continue to improve. We've got much better sanitation. Everybody's got an indoor toilet these days. You've got flush toilets. And this is where better medicine became even more important. You have the sulfur drugs in the 1930s, Gerhard Domek developed those, penicillin in the 1940s, DDT wipes out malaria, polio vaccines with a sock over here, uh, flu vaccines discovered in the 30s and things like that. This is where you really see the incredible field of medicine for public health. So the next thing we want to do is we want to talk about the Spanish flu of 1918. If I was to pick up the that's most similar that developed in 1918. It was a flu virus. Some people claim that the, that it started in China. There's been some recent studies, but there's an even more research study that's been showing that, uh, that that's probably not the location where this started out. Now, as a result of this, about 0.65% of the population died during about a one and a half year period. The life expectancy at birth fell 11.8 years in the year 1918. That's just incredible. That wiped out like about three or four decades of, of improvement. And you had about 20 to 50 million die, people die worldwide. What was really unusual about the Spanish flu was that it was hardest on people's ages 20 to 40, and then to people under five and over 65. But this is the real surprise, the age 20 to 40, 
It also, they discovered that a lot of tuberculosis patients probably died early as a result of this disease. And the horrible thing about this is that when you died, you, your face turned blue due to oxygen deprivation, which is a huge problem with COVID-19, and bloody liquid filled your victim's lungs until they suffocated, which has some similarities to COVID-19 as well. And it seemed to have caused an overreaction in the immune system, which is also like COVID-19. Now, so this gives you an idea of what the, what the distribution of the death rates were if you were really old or you were really young and then in the middle of the distribution. So this is the unusual feature of this. That's not very common in most epidemics. So here's some pictures related to this. I've got a ton of pictures and stuff in the slides. And I have a lot of extra information in the slides. So because I know you all are teachers, you want to make use of extra information. So you could probably give this lecture over three weeks or three, not three weeks, three days or three 50 hour, 50 minute hours. So the US military experience with the Spanish flu was probably our first experience with it. From between March and May 1918, about 14 of the largest army camps in the US were hit by influenza. Relatively few people became critically ill. And actually, they just put these guys on boats and sent them to France to fight around the, around the, the economy and around the warfare time in France. Between late August and October, you had a much more dangerous outbreak that occurred. It sickened about a fourth of the army. 30,000 died even before they got to France. The Navy lost about 5,000 men, had about 100,000 hospital admissions. I also, if you look at this, I also try to include sources where I can, so you can, you can find those sources. A lot of them are easy to get on the internet. So this gives you an idea of the deaths due to influenza and, and pneumonia over the period between 1913 and 1923. And what you can see is, is almost every year, they've got a flu season that's going on. You get these kind of excess deaths sitting here. And then here is the Spanish flu of 1918. It is just dramatically a huge increase. And then there's a slight recurrence that occurs in February 1920. And then after that, what you're finding is, is that the flu is just not as important for the next few years. And one of the reasons they think that this hit a lot of people with tuberculosis is, is that uh, fewer people were dying from the flu afterwards. Now, here's the story a lot of you may have already heard, and that's the story about Philadelphia versus St. Louis and about the problem of crowds. So if you look in Philadelphia, they had their first cases around September 17th, and then they had a major parade, the Liberty Loan Parade down, downtown, all sorts of people around. People started getting sick. By October 13th, they just closed schools, public gatherings were banned, social distancing. Their peak weeks of deaths were, was 257 per 100,000 people. So that's probably about 2,500, 2,570 deaths given their population at the time. And the total deaths overall, they had the highest death rate of anybody or any city between the period from September to December of 1918. And then they compare it to St. Louis. Now, St. Louis also had a Liberty Loan Parade. A lot of people didn't realize this when they see the story. The difference was is that their first cases were reported just prior to October, 15th, or October 5th. They started to immediately social distance. Their peak was only 57 per 100,000, and their total was only 347 per 100,000. Now, I want to point this out to you because this story is being told over and over again in the press. So here's a case where you can see cherry picking of stories. Okay, so the story here is, is they're actually cherry picking stories because the, the thing I want to point out to you is, is that Philadelphia, when they actually had the parade, they'd only had a death rate of like three people per 100,000. So probably about 30 people had died due to the virus during that time period. Now look at Cambridge, Massachusetts up here. So Cambridge, Massachusetts, the death rate in the week before they held their parade in the middle of October was 55. As a matter of fact, a week before that had been 163. And so you're sitting there going, well, why in Cambridge, Massachusetts being pointed out as the comparison? New York actually had two parades after they had 13 deaths per 100,000 and 27 deaths per 100,000 during this period. So if you look at the comparisons or whatever, they look a lot more like St. Louis does at the end. So now it's not that, that, that not, the parade definitely contributed to this problem. It contributed to problems for everybody in these kind of things. But Philadelphia is getting a bad rep in this kind of situation because they just got unlucky relative to what was going on. I mean, so you just look at this thing and just kind of stunned after you look at this. Now, here is typically what was going on in most of the cities. You hear about these kind of things and you read articles and they say, oh, well, you know, they all did close down for all this time and stuff. 
Well, typically what most people did was they closed down for about 28 days. Okay, and so they usually closed down in early October. They usually opened up again in early November. And now one of the things that made things more exciting at the end of that was that the, the end of World War II, World War I was November 11th. And so everybody is actually trying to celebrate that while they're coming out of these, these, uh, these uh, quarantines and things like this. So these are the kind of things they did. Uh, so you can see, uh, let me put you over here. So these are the kind of information, interventions that they did. These are 17 cities, about 15 of them closed churches, 15 closed theaters, 15 banned public gatherings, 14 isolations of cases, and 14 closed schools, okay? These are the same kind of things that Sweden is currently doing with COVID-19. What they didn't do was they didn't, like, they didn't close stores. So scores, what they did in New York City was they staggered the business hours. As a matter of fact, New York City did virtually none of these things, okay, during this time period. What they mostly did was stagger the business hours. There were no closings of non-essential businesses. And what you find here is that there's only two places, Seattle and another place, that, that had people wear masks. So that, you know, so that's a, there are a lot of different things that they tried to do. They couldn't come up with a vaccine. They didn't have a vaccine. It died out without a vaccine. And so they had to do other things. Now here's a comparison of the timing of closing of schools back then compared to what we've got, what was going on today. In 1918, the average number of deaths when they closed schools was 36.4 30, per 100,000 the week prior to the closing of schools and doing most of this other sh uh, shutting down. And the range was being between 1.25 and 158. In 2020, the US states, 36%, 36 states actually closed schools and other things with no COVID deaths in the prior week. The highest death rate at the time of school closure was about 0.4 per 100,000, and that was in New Jersey. Now, what this tells me is we are a much richer country now than we were back then, and we are much more concerned about safety and death rates. And naturally so, because what happens is our death rate is drastically lower than what it was almost 100 years ago. And so we're not, we're, we're not used to losing people in the way we did before. I mean, overall, we are in a much safer situation than ever, ever before, even though you're reading the news, we, we, it seems like things are going to hell in a handbasket all the time. Okay, now, the closures did help prevent deaths. Okay, and so the early intervention in, in most of these cities, if they had an early in intervention, caused the peak weekly death rate to go down by about 50%. Most closures lasted for less than six weeks. And, and so, but one of the things that happened is after we opened and went back through this, what you find overall, the early closures didn't do as much as you might have thought. They only reduced the overall death rate by 20%. So they did improve things. It's just that when you look over the time frame, what you find is it's not as big an effect early on, or as it was early on. Okay. So the economic impact of the Spanish flu, one of the most difficult things about this is to actually identify this effect because World War I ended right in the middle of the, of the Spanish flu epidemic in October, in, in November. And so the epidemic was pretty much over by de December in this kind of situation. And so what you find though is, is that almost everybody, what you find is you had severe problems in October, the close downs, people getting ill, were causing all sorts of problems with production. And then St. Louis actually closed all these theaters and, and no one went beyond. But then what happened is the conditions rapidly returned to normal in Boston in November. You can see that New York City uh, showed a size of gain toward the end of November again. You can also tell these stories for October in Philadelphia. They lost a lot of production, but they were more normal again after that. Uh, Atlanta improved quite a bit afterwards. And so you saw pretty much this was kind of a one month event. So the rest, of the, most of the rest of the talk is going to talk about Werner Treskin's book. Here's a picture of Werner. He's a very good friend. He was a very good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he died in 2018. But he wrote this great book, The Pox of Liberty, How the Constitution Left Americans Rich, Free, and Prone to Infection. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, he told kind of three large stories related to uh, yellow fever, smallpox, and typhoid fever that actually dealt with kind of the three major kind of ways to deal with epidemics that we had in history. And he also points out the importance of the American way of doing things, the constitutional way that we've done things, and how constitutions that, that leave people free to make all sorts of moves and become economically free sometimes lead to short run deaths in the short run during epidemics, but in the long run lead to 
much more effectiveness against epidemics. And I'll explain that more in de more detail. So it deals with all the same issues we're facing today, high and uncertain death rates, inadequate testing, there's no vaccine, we're racing to find one, we're trading off between economic losses and quarantines. It, medical facilities actually turn out to be inadequate now, uh, but there's uncertainty about when, when the disease might return in, in force. So the question, how and why have some societies controlled infection diseases while others have let them fester? So Werner wrote about public health for 20 years. And so during that time frame, he thought the answer was simple. All you needed was good governance, and that came from democracy. But it turns out that the history is more complex than that. And so what he found was, is that there's a trade-off. We have all these economic and political policies that promote economic growth, but at the same time can actually hinder public health efforts. And it kind of goes vice versa. So the key policies that everybody points to, Ajimolu, Robinson, and Johnson, Douglas North, almost any economic historian you can name, most economists talk about this as well, is protecting individual freedoms, private property rights where people can make sure that they have rights over the property over an extended period of time. Free trade across jurisdictions was a key to the economic growth of the United States. Federalism, which allowed people to experiment in all sorts of different ways, the rule of law, all of these things actually can, can help get can have mixed roots up. There's kind of like double-edged swords with all these things. In some ways, they improve the situation, and some things, they make things worse. So the here is the American disease prevention system over the last two and a half centuries. It's highly decentralized. It's, mostly, it's mostly, mostly based on strategies, investments, and municipal governments. It built that way up from townships in the early 1800s and stayed that way to a large extent now. Actually, the states have become more prominent during this, this event. The system relies almost universally on individual consent and private action. You know, we're making statements that we're asking, pe we're asking people to stay home. We kind of say we're forcing them to stay home, but most people are, out, are able to walk around, do all sorts of things. It's not the kind of things that are going on in China and in France and in Spain and Italy during, the, during their shutdowns. We rely heavily on property, property rights to induce investment in health-related infrastructure. And that's particularly true in the case of public, public water supplies. And that's a major story that Werner's gonna tell twice in the course of these three diseases. And everything is heavily influenced by mar market processes and commercial and business interests. The most stunning thing that happened with the COVID situation is what happened in, Jan in, in late January and early February with the CDC and the FDA. The CDC said, we're the ones that are gonna make the, the vaccine and we're gonna make the tests. We're gonna be the ones that do it right. They don't rely upon all these private agencies and all these nonprofits like universities to do these tests. And we lost three or four weeks in testing right there. And then the FDA was trying to slow things down at the same time. This was not the way America has dealt, in, dealt with things over the last 200 years most of the time. They've relied heavily on using both the public sector and the private sector to try to fight these problems. There are four key institutions that shape this American approach. And that is democracy. It allowed politicians to enjoy more electoral success if they could invest in disease prevention, like building public sanitation and water treatment plants. Private property rights. The key to private property rights is the, the ability to make a credible promise, a credible promise about the future. That what's going to happen is the lenders can be relied on being repaid. The entrepreneurs can, can rely on the idea that people are not going to take their property away once they've built it the taxpayers can rely upon the fact that their taxes are not going to go up beyond a certain level. Okay, so those credible promises are central to our ability to operate. And we have these constitutional laws that pro prohibit the states from altering debt obligations. That is a key to the development of our, of, our, of our whole credit system and the whole way of lending and of investing throughout the United States. This is why we're the, the leading place in the world for investments. Now, federalism shaped this as well. We're highly decentralized. Most of the powers in the Constitution that were outlined were given to the states. They, only, they actually specifically allocated powers to the federal government, but then they allocated the rest to the states. Now, this, in a good way, allows greater exper experimentation with different policies, but it creates problems because sometimes if you're controlling an epidemic, they cross state borders. And if you have different state policies that don't match, you've got a big problem. Another problem that develops has, has to do with vaccinations, and that is citizens have multiple venues in which they can challenge decisions of medical experts and authorities. And so the vaccination problem was a huge problem for smallpox. 
and has been a big problem for mumps and several other things today. And that is a coming problem when we actually start vaccinating people once we find a, a vaccine. And then individual liberty was extremely important. The 14th Amendment provides equal protection under law after the Civil War. And it also the Constitution prohibits states from taking life, liberty, or property without due process. So I'm going to tell a story about yellow fever and the initial things. And so these horrible features of yellow fever that you can see on here, the major problem was a mosquito that liked to hang out in, in actually clean water in cisterns and buckets. And it was mostly happened in the subtropics. Okay, so yellow fever hit older age groups much harder. It was very mild among children. Uh, African populations, because they grew up in subtropical and tropical areas, often resisted after a thousand years of repeated exposures. This carried over to slaves in, in America in the South during this time frame. American born in the cities, American born whites in the cities actually became resistant after about, you know, they had a bunch of repeat epidemics, I'll show you. So the people who survived had resistance. The biggest problem was is that immigrants did not have much resistance. Northern Europeans had almost no experience with yellow fever. And so these, whenever you had immigrants in a community, yellow fever hit them very hard. So yellow fever's nastiness. Now talk about situations. Yellow fever killed 15% of New Orleans population between 1817 and 1819. 25 in Shreveport, 12 and a half in Memphis. So we're talking about huge problems here. The case fatality rate was 70 to 90%. It is 10 times more deadly than the highest death rate in America during the, the Spanish flu. No vaccines. Matter of fact, we resolved this problem without vaccine, which is amazing enough. The epi we had a whole series of epidemics between 1668 and 1853. Louisiana had 166 different epidemics associated with yellow fever. The biggest problem always hit in the summertime. That's when the mosquito was most successful. And so what was happening was is ships from the, the tropics and subtropics like Havana, uh, like uh, Mexico and places like that would, be, would bring mosquitoes along with them and the mosquitoes would breed in this 70 to 90 degree, 90 degree Fahrenheit environment that was cr creating all sorts of problems with yellow fever. And so this is the thing. And matter of fact, here's some facts. Yellow fever never hit Natchez, Mississippi until the steamboat trade brought it upriver. Civil War blockades during, during the, in the Civil War, cut trade to New Orleans, and they went seven years without an epidemic during the Civil War. All that trade went to other Southern towns, and guess what? They got hit by epidemics instead. Public health officials would describe when they'd go on a boat where yellow fever seemed to be a problem, they'd hear a constant buzz of mosquitoes up in the, in the, in the sails and all sorts of things along those lines. Okay, so, but here's the, here's the great thing that happened. Yellow fever epidemics in major cities, look at this. What happens here in the 1790s, early 1800s, you have about 30 or 35 per year or per decade. By the time you get to the end of the 19th century, they're pretty much gone. And we don't get a vaccine until the 20th century. So what in the world's going on here? So how did the decline occur? Well, part one, various cities during the summers began imposing commercial quarantines on ships from Havana, Brazil, Mexico, and other West Indies ports. Uh, and so that helped. And so what you have is you have these temporary commercial quarantines on ships for about three or four, three or four months. And so, and then what they would do is they would quarantine people who, are, who would get sick. And actually, they, didn't, they weren't staying alive very long, so it wasn't hard to quarantine those folks. Now, another big factor here, and this was a major thing, is that the U.S. Army, after the Spanish-American War, went in and eradicated mosquitoes in Havana and Cuba. And that was a major source of shipping for the United States of all sorts of goods coming in. And so what happens is, look at what happens. They stop yellow fever. They kill all the mosquitoes in yellow fever, and they, get, they wipe it out, wipe out yellow fever in Havana, Cuba. And you can see... You know, the previous thing they showed you, what, the, the decline in mosquito activity in Havana, and you can see the decline over time in death rates in New Orleans here. Now, part two, what the Army did is not only did they claim this, that, you know, they went in and they killed all the mosquitoes, and then they told the, the other governments, you better keep leaving out the mosquitoes, because if you don't, we're coming back. And they passed a Platt Amendment that gave them the right to reinvade Cuba if another yellow fe fever epidemic broke out, and they reinvaded in 1905. So Teddy was out there, he was going to fly up San Juan Hill, he was going to show up again as a public health guy in 1905, didn't have to ride a horse that time. Okay, the Army also intimidated Veracruz, Mexico, and Rio de Janeiro into mosquito control. 
Veracruz, the death rate fell from mosquitoes from 9 to 0.2. 1914, the US military actually sent a mission to Veracruz to eradicate diseases again. And so in Rio, uh, same kind of thing, the, the disease, they cut the disease rate. All these cases was good trade policy to do this. Now, this is something that the federal government could do because we were associated with international trade. The major thing, though, is, is most of the police powers internally were left to the states. And the Commerce Clause was going to be a problem for, for, stop, for creating quarantines to stop other people. Okay, so the optimal quarantine during this time period was actually to have a short quarantine. And the reason for that was, is that the fever didn't tend to last more than four to eight days. The problem was if you had a long quarantine, people would not come to your city. They'd skip New York City, for example. they go to Boston. And then the people who all had the disease would actually show up in New York anyway. So it really wasn't working very well. The four-day quarantine turned out to work perfectly in New York. New York City had no problems after the 1805-1806 uh, season. Now, there's a big worry about states racing to the bottom. And so what happens is you have a strict quarantine. Everybody else does not have a, a quarantine. They get the trade and the infected people show up in your house. So the solution to this was often national rules. That was the idea. But the problem was is that there really were no situations for national rules at the time. I'm going to describe one attempt. All sorts of ports set quarantines, particularly during epidemics. And so it's not like they all race to the bottom. In fact, one of, the, one of the biggest problems that New Orleans faced was is that southern cities tended to quarantine ships coming from New Orleans at the merest, merest whisper of the idea that there was yellow fever. And then they would refuse to remove the quarantine when it had been, even though it had been conclusively demonstrated that New Orleans had no yellow fever. So now New Orleans created their own bed, though. So you can see Joan Jett over here. She's singing bad reputation for New Orleans because they failed to repay report all sorts of cases where they actually did have quarantines. So you just couldn't trust them. So one of the solutions they tried to come up with, they actually after 1879, in 1879 after the Memphis yellow fever epidemic, what they, they actually tried to create a national board of health. And Dr. John Woodworth was the primary guy who lobbied for its creation, although he died soon after they passed the law. So the idea was they, they were supposed to oversee over state issues, but they weren't supposed to interfere with the states and, and, and local governments very much. Now, the problem that they faced was, so the New Orleans was having all these problems reporting, and so the Sanitary Council, which was a local group of uh, public health officials, suggested that the National Board of Health be an independent reporter so people would trust New Orleans once again. As a matter of fact, New Orleans business leaders pushed really hard for this kind of thing because they were worried about losing trade. But the problem was Louisiana State Board of Health had personality differences with the people in the, North, uh, the National Board of Health. So that, that's bad news. So you can see why, uh, Chris, why Andrew Cuomo and all the governors kept being very nice to Donald Trump after January, trying to make sure there was no personality clashes and these kind of things. The MBH was closed down in 1883 due to both outside criticism and internal disagreements. So it didn't last very long. Now, there was a major group that did, did get cre created in the late, early 1880s that actually was highly successful eliminating animal diseases. And this, is, this story is told for the Bureau of Animal Industry. And it's told by Alan Olmsted and Paul Rohde in a great book called Arresting Con Contagion. So a lot of people think that regulation in the industry doesn't really start until 1867. It really starts in 1864 for agricultural industry, for livestock and slaughtering of livestock. By 1940, they had eliminated seven major animal diseases. And so this was an interesting situation because what they were doing was they were quarantining animals and eradicating diseases. And they had huge powers that you never will see again and never have seen before. They had the power to go in and destroy disease animals and enforce quarantines in ways that no one had before. And the most amazing thing about this story is, is that Rhodey and, and, and Olmsted have told this story, hardly anybody seems to remember any of this at all including people at the U.S. Department of Agriculture when they gave a talk there. So here's the problem in Memphis. Okay, so yellow fever and sanitation. Remember I told you after 1880, yellow fever pretty much gets eliminated. Well, a lot of this has to do with cities trying to clean up filthy areas. And Memphis was one of the first. And one of the things they ran into was is they thought that yellow fever was being caused by bad sanitation. 
That's actually incorrect, but they thought that that was the story going on here. And so they thought, okay, look, we're gonna to try to clean up what's considered to be the filthiest and most deadly appearing town in the union. And we're gonna make it clean. We're gonna attract migrants industry and trade. So what they did was they joined local officials to create a vast sewer system. In about eight years, they built out most of the sewer system, which is a map of that is sitting up here. This caused the mortality rate to drop by 50% in less than 10 years. Now, most of this came from waterborne diseases like cholera, diarrhea, and typhoid. Ironically, even though they were trying to stop yellow fever, they actually stopped all these other things with the sanitation cleanups, and it had very little effect on yellow fever because the big problem was mosquitoes in clean water. Same story happens in New Orleans. In this case, what they did, they've been having huge problems with all sorts of butchers lined up along the Mississippi River and dumping all their animal waste into the river upstream from the city. That's a big thing to learn. Never put the waste upstream when it's gonna flow right back down beside you. So they set up a spot south of New Orleans for the slaughterhouses. As a matter of fact, it created a monopoly. This angered local businessmen because it created that monopoly, but the overall death rate declined afterward. So I'm gonna show you the next slide. And you can see, here's the death rate in New Orleans. You can see a big drop right after these kind of things going on. So it's dropping down. And so mostly this was business interest as well as public interest pushing for these kind of things. Okay, so I'm at the 347 mark. I need a ruling from Ted because uh, I'm going to run out of time in a minute, but I've actually lost about five minutes to, uh, to being dumped off the thing. Do I, can I get an extra five? You bet, of, of course. Okay. okay, now here's the problem that may pop up in the next few months once a vaccine is found, and that's the problem with smallpox. Now, so they, smallpox, according to Werner, has the record for killing most people in history. In the 1700s, 90% of adults likely had it. Uh, in the mid 1700s, it probably is harming about a fourth of the world population in any one year. And you can see what it looks like when you have a nasty case. Okay, now it was worse in the US relative to elsewhere. And the reason was is because we had all these anti-vaccination fights in the United States. You had a small minority with intense opinions, battled a much larger minority that did not have those deeply held positions. And so what happens is the due process and equal protection clauses of the Constitution and access to an independent judiciary gave the small minority a great deal of power. First of all, school officials had to actually pass laws to require vaccinations, and those laws take time. And then the people who are opposed to vaccinations could then take the issue to court and fight it. And so what you found was federalism led to a patchwork of laws throughout the United States. And so some states had vaccinations and required them, other states did not. So smallpox, uh, this is stuff you can see, uh, and so it survived in highly dense regions. And um, the single most important determinant was whether or not the population had immunity. So they, in the 1700s, they figured out a way to, for smallpox vaccinations when they discovered that people who were, who were, that had, were, were around cows that had cowpox were not seen to, were exhibiting mild symptoms. So what they came up with is an arm to arm vaccination. You go to someone who has smallpox, you cut open your arm, you infect your own arm, and then you go from there. This is how General Washington inoculated all the troops in Boston in 1775 or 1776. Abigail Adams, there's a famous story, if you ever watch the HBO uh, series on, Abigail, on John Adams, you'll find that Abigail Adams in this letter describes in July of 19, 1776, she inoculated her four children and herself. This included future president John Quincy Adams. She describes in the letter how the little forks are very sick then and they puke every morning, but after that, they're very comfortable. So you know the kids will love that story right there. Okay, now the vaccine was developed in the early 1800s, but there was widespread opposition. Okay, there was a lot of, lot of anti-vaccinationists who said that smallpox came about from unsanitary living conditions. Does that sound familiar? That was the story being told about yellow fever as well. And that it could be improved by improved sanitation. They went out and cherry picked data from London and Sweden to tell this story. And in reality, what happened is laws mandating vaccination were introduced. Smallpox rates fell. So look at this. Here's the situation in England. You can compare these English counties. Unvaccinated populations, attacks, or death rate is 43 per thousand. In the vaccinated populations, at 4.7. You look in other cities, you can see here's in smallpox in London. They eliminated after the vaccination. You can see it in Sweden after compulsive vaccination, it just goes away. Okay, 
So what you find is the anti-vaccine arguments were being made that there, it's not clear the vaccine works, the vaccine itself can cause illness, it's a violation of individual rights. As late as 1975, North, North, Dakota, North Dakota law prohibited state authorities from forcing children to get vaccinated to attend the schools. North Dakota's smallpox death rate is 10 times higher than it was in the states. Now, hopefully this issue won't pop up, but we know that there are anti-vaccination groups in here that are gonna have worries about this future vaccine. And one of the things you can see is you, the richer countries are over here in 1900. They also tend to have more personal freedoms and stuff, and they tend to have higher, higher smallpox rates than a lot of other countries do that, are, that, that, that tend to have more control. A lot of these people like Sweden and Germany, they tend to follow orders most, more, more, more readily. So you can see what happens in Cuba and Puerto Rico, pre-vaccine, post-vaccine, pre-vaccine, post-vaccine. So it's really clear that vaccines were the key. Okay, so, but th that's where the trade-off is. You know, this is why the constitution helps make us richer, but also more, more subject to epidemic disease. Then there's typhoid. This is the last one that Werner, Werner talks about. Typhoid, the story really here is about public works and particularly sanitation and water treatment. So you've got all different ways that it spreads, how sick you can get and things like this. So at one point by 1900, about one in every three people in America had contracted it and you contracted it by drinking contaminated water. William Boyd discovered this in 1840. I think the PBS had a, had a nice uh, story about this on Masterpiece Theater at one time, okay? Now, typhoid killed both directly and indirectly. So they'd nail you in the first 5% of the, five or 10% of the cases directly or indirectly, they'd catch you later on. So cleaning up water was the key. Remember I told you that the largest reduction in mortality in history occurred between 1850 and 1950? About 60% of that could be attributed to clean water supplies during those time frames, according to Werner. And so the investments in the urban water systems were some of the largest public investments in American history. So why, what's going on with the Constitution and property rights? Cities had to credibly commit for this to work because they're building such large investments. They have to credibly commit to repay the loans. And they also have to credibly commit that if someone goes out and builds a huge water treatment plant, that they don't go in and expropriate the plant themselves. Okay, and these commitments were made possible by state and federal constitutional provisions that protected private property rights and fostered capital markets. So here you can see just how big they are. Here are some of the huge, biggest public works projects in American history. And you can see that city sanitation works and aqueduct and water systems actually rival the Hoover Dam, the Panama Canal, the Transcontinental Railroad. So these things were huge. And imagine you're a city trying to invest in, trying to, to invest in enough money to get these kind of things. So another thing is, is the number of urban waterworks grew from like only about 45 in 1830 to nearly 10,000 in 1924. A lot of the original waterworks were owned privately, about 80%. That dropped to 30% by the time you get to about 1924. So real municipal debt, to build these things, you had to go into debt. And if you look at this time of things, cities were the predominant group that was, was borrowing money to be able to build these kind of public works. The only thing that was somewhat similar to this was building highways after the developed automobile. So why did the water companies move from private to standard? The ar standard argument is kind of a positive externality argument. The private companies don't want to, won't necessarily pay attention to positive action externalities. But the problem with that story is the private companies actually do control access because they control the water mains. They're the ones that built them. So really it's more of a problem coming from threats that the city might take over the water company and possibly not pay adequate, or adequate, adequate payment under due process, okay? And so, you know, they have to, under the takings clause, you're supposed to pay people the, the market value. So if, they, if, this, if the water company thinks it's gonna be taken over or, or the city starts regulating with lower water rates, the water company is gonna have less incentive to improve quality, and then it's gonna be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so that often, that often happened during this time frame. And you can see here are the transitions for all these various states. In that, in that time frame. So that's the end of the story as far as Werner's going on and things along those lines. I can talk to you very briefly. If you wanna ask me, I can tell you a little bit about what's going on with the government response uh, to the COVID situation right now. But I think I'll just go ahead and stop there and open the floor for questions. Great, Price, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And 
Definitely glad we got the uh, the tech issue worked out quickly. So yeah, tech issue, boy. I, I, I tell you, I've, I've taught ex with using Zoom and things like this for years, and I've never had any of these problems. Not a single one of them. <laughs> so well, we got it all worked out. Well, here the first question um, for you is: This is um, Michael is asking this question, and you're at a little disadvantage because you didn't watch the webinar we did a week ago. But oh, right, okay. But he's asking, from last week's webinar, it was discussed that flattening the curve would result in a longer contractionary period and slower recovery. Would you agree or disagree with this? Uh, are you talking about a slower economic recovery? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, yeah, definitely. That was part of the idea was. I mean, so basically what's going on is, is that, you know, really what they're trying to do by flattening the curve and having people stay home and, and, and distance themselves um, is to is really to flatten the curve and actually produce, produce death, reduce, reduce the number of death rates to the point that hospitals and people can, ha can handle it. Now, the other feature of that too, though, is it seems like that they've, the targets moved a little bit. Now they're not so much worried about, about dealing with the hospitals because we've discovered that we have plenty of, of capacity for the hospitals right now. Uh, but now they're, they're talking about mostly about preventing deaths. And so that's a big problem right now. And so the big question is, how much of the economy do you have to close down or actually reduce to actually be able to eliminate a lot of those deaths? And so one of the biggest problems we face is, is the vast majority of deaths in a lot of these cases are occurring for people over the age of 65. And in, a matter of fact, in Sweden, where they actually left there pretty much open and they just had let people volunteer to do this, 85% uh, of their deaths are over the age of 70. So the biggest problem there is that. And so it seems like what you really want to do is you want to really, really be protecting those populations and then letting a lot of large, larger segment of the rest of the populations go out and go back to work and do things along those lines. And so we're, in a, we're starting to get to the point where we really do need to go back to work because we just can't afford to continue going on along these lines. And that's where the, I can talk about the government response more if you want. Okay. Great, great. Um, so Barry uh, is asking this question here. He says, our textbooks talks about an economic recession in the US soon after the First World War, but seems to attribute it to a decline in the war industries. How much did the flu pandemic contribute to this downturn? So the, most of the flu, flu pandemic, in my view, actually just lasted for about a couple of months, or right, two or three months. So I remember I, I had those examples that I gave you of what the Federal Reserve Board was doing. They went out and collected information about each city. There's a recent study, uh, I think it was by uh, Robert Barrow at Harvard and, and some, a couple of other guys, where what they, they try to do is they try to see, or not, that's actually an international study. It was another study where what they tried to look at is the places where they, they isolated more, where that picture I drew. They, th those places, how long did it take for them to recover like manufacturing and things like that? And they find somewhat of an effect. But the biggest problem is, is most of the action associated with the epidemic and closing down things for the epidemic occurs almost at the same time, like within a month of when World War I stops. Okay, and so what's really going on is both of these things are happening. It's really hard to parse that out. Now, I think the reason for the 21-22 recession really being because of the war industries is because the, the, the the virus lasts a relatively short period of time. Even though we were not in the war in 1918, until 1918 or late 1917, we had been producing a lot to support the allies before that time frame. And so agriculture had, had risen markedly during that time period because we were feeding most of Western Europe and made feeding most of the world's population at the time that we're fighting. Another thing that happened is coal production ran, went through the roof. Uh, all sorts of production of military hardware and things like that went through the roof. And, and we literally stopped building houses during that time frame. Now what happens is all those industries, shipbuilding, all the things that really boomed during the, the period during the war, they had a, a, a fallout after the war because all that demand fell pretty sharply. And so we had this short recession in 21, 22, while everything kind of realigned itself. And so luckily it was a very short recession. And so we didn't have to do very much to get it back on its feet. And actually pretty much we just left it alone and it kind of turned around. Another problem that occurred too was is there were a lot of strikes during this period because they, during the war, they actually they had supported collective action and supported unions during the war. But after the war, 
all the, the employers wanted to go back to the situation before, the, during the war, or before the war, whereas all the workers wanted to keep the situation during the war. And they had huge fights over this for a couple of years and the unions basically lost in that time frame. Great, thank you. Um, Susanna asks, was there a coordinated collusion amongst governmental leaders during the Spanish flu or yellow fever to reopen the economy at the same time and in the same way? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, the closing, I mean, you saw the closings, like they had like 17 cities in that list. Those are the ones they had the most information about. And those are, that's a pretty substantial share of the population as well during that time period. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of that. I'm not enough of an expert to really know if that's the case. Uh, I think one of the things that happened was is that you could see the, the death rate was dropping. And so I think that's when they felt safe to do that. But I, I just, I don't have enough information to be able to say whether there was collusion or not. Yeah. Uh, another question for you is from Brian. And Brian is uh, commenting, he says, it sounds like Professor Price is a big believer in states' rights, private property, and laissez-faire policies, which he feels will result in in an ending of our current pandemic. What role does he feel that the federal government should play? Well, the federal government's already playing a major role. And so what they're, they're doing is, and so look, I'm not a state's rights or anything. I was just describing what Werner described in his book. Okay, I think that all levels of government are extremely important. It turns out that our, our public health system has largely been dominated by state and local governments throughout our entire history. And that was Werner's major point. So we have a lot of different experiences. Um, now, whether or not we're gonna solve the problem without having national stuff, I mean, I think the federal government's role in this is actually, I think, is the backstop what's going on. And one of the key things that's been going on is, is the federal government is spending a very, very, very large amount of money trying to prop up businesses and trying to keep people having connections between the businesses and their workers and in between lenders and their borrowers so that things don't break down in a way where you have to start from scratch once we open everything up. Because if we have to start from scratch, everything, once you open everything up, it's going to be that be tremendously harder to probably add like another year until things start, start back up again. So the examples of what I'm, trying, what I'm giving you here is the following. The PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Plan, overall they're going to give out about $600 billion, which is about 3% of GDP. Uh, for these PPP plans. And the idea was to keep people on the payroll at those companies so you don't break that connection between the workers and, the, and, their, and, their, and, their, and their companies. So if you can keep it in that kind of thing, all they do is walk back into work and they start up immediately. If you break that connection, people get fired, the companies go down, then you're in deep trouble because then what you have to do is you have to restart all these businesses and that's just a nightmare. Same kind of thing is going on with unemployment insurance. When the federal government came in and handed out $600 per person on unemployment, what they did was they topped up the unemployment insurance system in a way that made it much easier for people who are furloughed but are still maintaining or laid off and still maintaining a relationship with their employer to be able to go to be able to maintain what's going on. Now, the biggest mistake I think the Trump administration made was when they're dealing with things was it's not so much by allowing the individual uh, states to actually pick when they were going to close down and when they're going to open up. The big mistake there is, is kind of forcing the states to actually negotiate with all these various buyers for all the, the protection equipment, equipment, like the N95 masks, the gowns, and all those kind of things. We would have been much better off if the federal government had negotiated with everybody with a single negotiator going from a position of strength, negotiating with all these companies and the fly-by-night ones as well as the good ones, rather than have 50 states trying to fight and compete for. I think that was a big mistake on that part. All right, great. Thank, thank you, Price. Uh, maybe we have one time for one last question. Um, and this one is from Chris. And Chris asks, what conspiracy theories existed during the Spanish flu trying to explain it? Yeah, I, I just don't know. <laughs> there are some books, actually there, there are two or three uh, pretty good books that I saw on Amazon that you might check out. Um, and so uh, I would just read those books to see what they have to say. I just don't know anything about conspiracy theories during that time frame. There's plenty of conspiracy going on because we're fighting a war, 
Okay, so there, we know there's conspiracies going on between different countries, there are spies and all sorts of things. Were the conspiracies among people who were public health officials and stuff? I just don't know. I don't, I don't think so, but I just don't know. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Professor Fishback, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone else, for, for tuning in and asking such great questions and, and listening. Uh, we will be posting uh, the video of the presentation as well as uh, PowerPoints on the FTE website, and we'll be emailing that to you um, in the next day or so. So again, thank you, everyone, very much, and thank you, Professor Fishback. Thank you for being here. Thanks for, thanks for listening to me. All right. Take care.